I'm grateful that we're here. Talk about uh, maybe how you got started, um, how you know how you uh, work with other folks in the industry, uh, other indigenous people. Um, bring like you mentioned the Santa Fe uh, Independent Film Festival, um, and also some future uh, work that you have coming up. We'll be wrapping up about 150 or so. Uh, so um, just to, so you have that on. Great, David put SantaFeIndependent.com in the chat. Uh, dos, uh, my name is Missy Whiteman. I belong to the Northern Arapaho and Kickapoo Nations. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all today. And um, at the 2021 Thunder Indigenous Fest uh, Film Festival um, out of Fond du Lac College. And it's such an honor to be here with all of you. A uh, special thank you to um, Liz, David, Jeremy, and it's an honor doubly to be here with Mr. Kirby. <laughs> um, hi, Kirby. I was telling, um, I won't share it right now, but maybe later, how long we've known each other. <laughs> yeah, it's a yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Mr. Farmer, too. It's wonderful to be here with both of you. So I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, I won't say since diapers, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass it to you, Kirby. Okay. Uh Buju, uh Wendigo and Dishnakaz, uh Mangan and Dodem, um uh, Boyd Fort and Dunjaba. Uh what I just said to you is that my name is Giant Heart. I am from the Wolf Clan and I am a member of the Boyd Fort uh band of Ojibwe. And uh my given name at birth is Sir Curtis Kirby the third, but everybody just calls me Kirby. Um and I'm it's truly an honor to be on this panel and um to share this space uh, kind of as a youngster, even though I'm getting older a little bit, you know, but very honored to be here and um, uh, excited. Thank you. Hi, it's Gano Spagway, going to go so high end. What's, no, when is we are what? Now it goes by this. Yeah, hello everybody. My name is Gary Farmer. Um, it's a beautiful sunny day today and I thank the creator for that. Uh, I'm from uh, originally from the Six Nations along the Grand River in Ontario, uh, just about 18 miles west of Hamilton, Ontario. I grew up in Buffalo, Niagara Falls, New York. Um, I'm out here in Santa Fe, New Mexico right now, and it's a real honor to be with you. Thank you. I work as an actor primarily. Oh, miigwech. So, um, we are recording, just so that said. Uh, AHEC is our partner in this festival, uh, American Indian Higher Education Consortium, and uh, and they're hoping to use the recordings then, you know, for uh, other educational purposes. Um, and uh, it, and we'll. I don't know if the, uh, Thunder and Digifest will roll into another one next year. I don't know. So they might use it for promotion too. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, but uh, we're here. Uh, it, talking about multimedia production, which encompasses everything, really, when you think about it, because it's so vague of a term. Um, but that's good, because uh, like many people are working in many different capacities in media, uh, and making um, performances or making appearances. Uh, now, definitely during COVID, uh, even Gary was talking about all the things he's doing, you know, with the, having a, a talk show and uh, trying to do auditions through the computer. And, you know, like there's so many things, right? So um, that's, uh, you know, why we invited the three of you here uh, together to have a conversation about what is it really like right now? You know, what are we doing with multimedia right now? I'll kind of just go just in general and just talk about a little bit what I do and who I am because probably... Uh least known about what I do on this, but uh, I work with the Ikitawan Youth um, Acting Ensemble, and I'm the director of them. And originally, they used to be the Ogichida players back in the day, and um, it's a program that is um, underneath the umbrella of Indigenous Peoples Task Force um, that was started by Sharon Day. And we started doing theater with youth about 29, 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, have uh, I grew up in that system and I grew up in that program and that's how I actually met Missy uh, when I was in probably in diapers or some sort. So I've been around uh, the theater and the arts most of my life and I'm honored to be able to um, 
to direct the youth ensemble. And our youth ensemble is a group of uh, youth that are ranged from the age of 11 to, uh, it used to be 11 to 18, but really 11 until you start working for us or helping out within the program or, you know, just kind of fade off into college. But we're really just trying to not uh, put a cap on it anymore because I think the those there's often this like, um, this gap where our youth, you know, they turn 18 and then it's like, where do they go? And they have to figure out the real world. So we're trying to be here as um, a tool and uh, help them navigate and connect with people and continue uh, working in the arts. So that's just a little bit about what I do. Oh, me great. I, I think I can share this. Uh, I can just play it here. You should hear it. Let me. Uh... This is G for location, location. It's 1950 when a tracking shot picked up on a tow truck from Chico's garage, a repair and towing service in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that's towing an open convertible sedan coupe suspended from its front end by a hoist. Behind the wheel of the broken down sedan was its chauffeured owner, Chuck Tatum, or Kurt Douglas, calmly reading a local newspaper. In the memorable entrance scene, from the 1951 release of Ace in the Hole, the down-on-his-luck car owner was wearing a hat and double-breasted suit. He sat up and looked around and yelled for the tow driver to stop in front of the Albuquerque Sun Bulletin building. He exited from the car onto the sidewalk where some Native Americans in traditional tribal dress are standing and walking by. Inside the office, Tatum rudely greets one of the Indian news editors played by Iron Eyes Cody wearing his long hair pulled back Navajo style with the condescending Indian expression, how, without any sense of respect for cultural differences. I talked with Iron Eyes Cody's son, Tree Cody, from his Santa Ana Pueblo home. Oh, no, only thing I only know about that scene was that I just saw him spot in when uh, Kirk Douglas comes in there and says, how? And I started laughing when my dad said, oh, a good afternoon, sir. And then there's another scene in there. Uh, my father comes in there and he brings uh, Kirk Douglas a sandwich and everything. And then he goes, yeah, here's your sandwich and everything. And no, next time, no more chopped liver at this time. And that was, I remember that scene there where dad was telling him that, you know, no more chopped liver and everything. And I had to get a little smile on that that scene, you know, telling Kirk Douglas that. Quiet, everybody! Listen to me! Listen! The story is a biting examination of the seedy relationship between the press, the news it reports, and the manner in which it reports it. The film also shows how a gullible public can be manipulated by the press. That was an awesome piece, Gary. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I do this... Uh, that radio show I was promoting in the beginning. Um, I do this little piece called Location, Location, and I, I find a particular location, you know, in New Mexico, generally. And um, I um, and then uh, I do a little history on the community itself, uh, generally, the location itself. And then uh, there's usually a film made there. Um, so far, I've done uh, Milagro Beanfield War, uh, Wild Hogs, uh, and generally, I try to find the uh, native angle to it. You, you know, I'm just doing uh, Better Call Saul. And, uh, you know, there's a native actor in there, uh, Jeremiah Bitsui. So I found Jeremiah. And uh, we talk about the series because he was also in Breaking Bad. And uh, I, I just produce these. They're between seven and ten minutes. And I, I just played it because it's amazing what you can do with audio. Um, you know, uh, we do put these on YouTube originally, eventually, and uh, and use some, you know, we have interviews with primary uh, film artists and stuff. That's the bulk of the show. And then my little pieces, if I can get them done each week. But uh, I produce that independently on my own. Um, I mix it. I go to a studio that I've been using for my music and stuff. So it's a little more pricey than if I came to you guys and you guys produced it. But... You know, I think what I'll do is I got about five or six of them. I, maybe I'll send it to the, uh, you know, the, the tribal station there uh, for you guys and um, or send it to you guys if you have a show on the tribal station, which you should by now. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to show the power of audio uh, 
And once you discover, that's why I think developing stories on radio first, because it's so cheap. I mean, you know, that cost me $225. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know that, but if I had your studios, I could do that for nothing. Right. So I just wanted to uh, just show you an example of uh, stuff. That's about seven hours work though. You know, it's time consuming to, but all that stuff came off the internet, all the audio, everything came from YouTube or, some source. So, you know, I, I just pulling clips. I'm not using full songs, uh, but that, that particular one, Ace in the Hole was a really interesting film from back then because of its, you know, current issues of dealing with the press, which we just saw four years of that. Right. So the power of the press and how important it is that we have a voice in the press. So, all right, you guys, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to jump in because I'm super nosy and curious, um, not nosy or curious, but I've been wanting to ask you this question, Gary, for, for a little while. And I'm really, I'm happy I have the opportunity to ask you right now. First of all, the uh, Milagro Bean, Beanfield War was my first rated R movie that I got to see in the theater. So mom and dad took us to the to the movie to see that. And I think that was my first like movie that they're like, it's okay, it's rated R, you're with us. And I think um, a lot of people, a lot of native people went to see it here in the Twin City or in the Twin Cities. Um, so the, the question that I have for you actually has to do with Ghost Dog, Way of the Samurai, and then also Dead Man and the character Nobody. And I'm wondering if that character, um, if that's connected, if the character in both films um, the gentleman on the rooftop and then the character in dead man, nobody, if they're connected at all. Um, well, the reason I'm in uh, ghost dog, uh, the ways of the samurai is because, uh, uh the director, uh, James, Jim, Jim Jarmusch, uh, who directed both films, uh, probably America's most celebrated independent filmmaker. He's not studio owned, uh, Although, you know, he's working with Amazon, I think, now to make movies, which, you know, everyone's trying to find a way and means to uh, make things easier for themselves, I guess. Uh, distribution's really hard, you know, while there's more avenues now than ever. But uh, anyway, uh, on the film set of The Making of Dead Men, uh, which you haven't seen, it's a uh, kind of a revisionist history of uh, the settling of the West. It's kind of like a genre bender of the Western and kind of taking it from a bit of a native perspective of the settling of the West. So if you haven't seen that film, it's uh, worth a look at just for that reason of, uh, you know, realizing that uh, with cinema, we can revision certain genres, certain concepts, certain storylines. So. Uh, a good one to uh, for me to uh, break would be like uh, in Canada, they always say that the Haudenosaunee were uh, violent, uh, bloodthirsty kind of people. But uh, this whole story of the Huron, for instance, us going and wiping them out, it was because alcoholism, they were, they were trading alcohol for, for beaver to start when they first came to this continent. And uh, that's what we went and tried to wipe out was that infection of the impact of alcohol on the people. And that story is never told that way. It's always like, uh, you know, uh, those folks up there got Christianized first, right? When the, that's what they used was Christianity to, to kind of uh, bring people around and uh, be able to control and manipulate them. So, you know, I, that's a, like a myth I'd love to debunk, right? Uh, but that's a big movie. Um, <laughs> But in any case, uh, the director and I had a lot of discussion because I thought, you know, the meek inherited the earth, right? I didn't think I was going to die, right? Dead man, I, I, uh, um, I thought that I'd go back and find my girlfriend, you know, and um, and um, so we we always had discourse about that, and uh, right till the end, and you know, in the film, if you watch Dead Man, it does look like I do die. Uh, I get shot for sure. But uh, 
uh, about a couple of years after we made Dead Man, which is around 95. I'm not sure when he made Ghost Dog. Must have been early 2000. Um, uh, maybe it was later. Um, you know, he asked me to be, that he, he, he thought that I was right, that nobody is still alive and wandering the earth. And that's why I appear in uh, Ghost Dog, The Ways of the Samurai, and, you know, working with Forrest Whitaker there to protect the bird and keep his pigeons going. And the Italian goombas or the mobsters come in and kill the bird. And I use one of the famous lines from Dead Man in response. So it's just a direct filmmaker correlation, kind of a fun thing. Uh, I was happy to do it. Yeah, I caught that. I was like, I've always been curious what that connection is. And yeah, that's one of our favorite quotes too in our, well, and plus I'm a white man, right? So that's kind of, <laughs> that's my last day. So it kind of, right? Yeah. Didn't work for a few years after that, but <laughs> it was good. Yeah. Yeah. I got an, I had an opportunity uh, last year to meet Jim. Um, he came okay. to the Twin Cities. Yeah. For screening. Yeah, He, he was uh, extremely helpful. You know, when I was big in Toronto with uh, establishing the film festival there and, uh, and we had a TV show going uh, uh, Buffalo tracks. Uh, we launched a television network. I had the, the radio network going and uh, Jim often would come up and sit with uh, all of our trainees or people learning the business. And um, he had a big impact on a lot of our artists up there and native artists at the time. He's a good man, yeah. And uh, I saw a piece um, that was on YouTube, Gary, uh, where you talked about that, uh, you know, getting to know him. Uh, and mm -hmm. then you talked about you got you start in um, theater, that you were doing uh, musicals or something, right? Oh, I worked in the theater since 1975, uh, all the way to, well, I still work in the theater. I, I do regional theaters. Uh, you know, I just finished uh, a play working with uh, Mary Catherine Nagel uh, on her new piece called Sovereignty. I, I'm about to direct the piece. We were going to direct a, a Christmas in Ochopi, which is, a, um, you know, Florida Everglades uh, Indian story. Uh, the tribe slips me right now. Well, the Seminole related, but uh, got their own uh, beautiful name too. Mikasuki. Is it Mikasuki? Yeah, Mikasuki people. So, uh, you know, the theater is my first love. So, any chance I get, whether to direct or act. Uh, you know, I love uh, working in the theater. That's where I come from. But, uh, you know, uh, I think the first film I did was like Police Academy or, you know, I did some Canadian productions before Police Academy, but that was the first feature film I did. But yeah, I come, I come from a theatrical background as an actor, yeah. Yeah, and that's where um, uh, Kirby and, and Missy uh, have that connection. And Kirby, right now you're directing um, the the youth ensemble. Yeah, I'm directing the youth ensemble. Um, we're still working or trying to figure out how to work. Um, as you know, as times that they've let us um, come back to in person, we've done some in person things, but we've been trying to carry on through Zoom and um, like do small things like group families together that live with each other and like uh, have them do scenes together. And so we recently just did, um, we're just playing around. We don't have really like the tools or the resources, but we do have like iPads. And so we've like recently like just shot like some scenes on an iPad, someone asked us to do something. And so we've done that, but yeah, we're working on um, two new pieces right now. Uh, we kind of have like a younger group that's kind of like more, um, it's called Keep the Fire Alive. And they are kind of like the ages from like 12 to 15. And that's like where we just kind of teach them some of the basics and elements of theater and um, starting giving them vocal training and things like that. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely, uh, I'm on a panel. 
Um, <laughs> sorry about that. This is the the difference of what, what we deal with, right? Usually we're in a room. And so I have like a little piece that I can just share like a scene of like some of the works because a lot of the theater that we do is educational theater. But I would also like to, you know, um, start, you know, me and Sharon have talked about diving into the realm of some of, you know, um, just creating stories, you know, by native, you know, we have love stories. We have all these different stories and it doesn't always just have to be. Um, it's good to get out the education out there and, you know, put that out there. But we also want to show the talents of our youth and let them tell their own story. So that's what we're kind of doing right now, doing the research and the things necessary. But the piece that I'm going to show you right now is more of like an educational piece. Yeah, so this is just done on iPad. It's not, you know, we actually just recently got a grant to, um, you know, shoot some of these pieces that we're doing, like with uh, people that, you know, videographers and things like that, and, you know, work on different angles and pictures. But this is just like one flat, you know, you'll just get one look at it, but I'll just show a scene. My show's on, turn the channel. Why? I thought you wanted to watch SpongeBob. I don't want to watch SpongeBob. Why? Why do you always do this? Because I don't want to watch SpongeBob. I want to watch what I want to watch. But I like it. I don't like it, so let's change it. No! Yes! Hey! Why don't you watch TV upstairs? YouTube! Shut the fuck up! Before I come over there and smack y'all! I hate you. I hate you too. Oh, oh hey kids, I'm home. Hey, Dad. Hi, Dad. What y'all want to give me that remote? Nathan, get in this kitchen right now. I don't know how this goes. The electric company called, and they said if we don't make the payments by the 15th, they're gonna cut off our electricity. I thought they couldn't cut it off the electricity. This is electricity, not the heat. And we're 10 days late on rent. I need you to put the paycheck in the bank so I can pay off the bill. And I'll pay you back from the beat work I sold on Friday. I already cashed my paycheck. I can pay Maggie seventy-five dollars for this transmission for the car. Why? You knew I had to pay Maggie. Okay, but what about the rest of your paycheck? Where did that go? Why are you bothering me? And so that was just a little piece of um, what we do and some of the things and us trying to adapt in these crazy times right now and being able to, you know, like there's a, you know, when you do theater, it's different because, you know, you, you rehearse, you rehearse, you rehearse and you get to that point. And so now we're just diving into a new realm right now and just making sure that we can um, continue to keep growing and, you know, elevating these kids and, you know, um, and really just like the connections that we have and really sharing those connections and making sure this is not just like a, uh, uh, a starting point for them, but really a tool that they can use, you know, going forward for the rest of their lives that um, you never know where you'll end up. So just wanted to share that. Yeah, I've been working with the new native theater down there in Minneapolis. They're a pretty good company. They do everything online right now, of course, because of COVID. So, you know, you guys should uh, work it out to be involved with some of their workshops. They have an annual play festival and they're producing you know, professionally, um, three or four plays a year. So I do a lot, of the, you know, they do a lot of writing workshops. And, you know, I did, I, uh, I was participant on a, a play read there with them and stuff. So it's a great little company. They're right nearby. So that'd be good to sister up with them. Mm, thanks, Gary. Yeah. New Native Theater. Yeah. I thought that was pretty good. I enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Kirby. Yeah, that like it just really, you know, there's so much emotion, there's so much talent, and you know, there, uh, and and it can reach through this screen, but it, you know, it does have, and it forces us to reassess, and it forces us to look at uh, things in a different way. But um, creative natives, man, we just put the challenge in front of us, and we'll figure out how to do it because that's in our genes. We are adaptable. We are here because we are adaptable. 
and you guys are doing it. This is um, this is so exciting. Misty, what are you up to? Um, right now, I am working on uh, some pre-production work. Um, I'll be gearing up to do uh, more youth media training starting towards the end of the summer. Um, and just seeing what does that look like. So uh, for the most part, just writing, um, starting to write. And then we had like three projects that, uh, you know, that happened within a month. It was um, that we come from the stars that we premiered last night or premiered here last night. And then, um, which is a short documentary about uh, constellation star maps, uh, creation stories, and our, our, the connection between Dakota, Ojibwe, or Anishinaabe, and um, Arapaho people. And then the second one was uh, to honor missing and murdered women. And it featured photographs that uh, Nadonis, Rose, Nadonis Rose Green took. And that was really a gift for the people to honor the people that are doing this work that are really not um, in the forefront. And then um, another project for Diane Wilson, who's um, for her book launch, um, about seeds uh, based on her spoken word uh, poem. And just right now, just figuring out like what's the next phase. Um, this summer I'll be working on a mural in St. Paul. And so it'll give us an opportunity to try out uh, video mapping and performance and bring together those elements. Um, but there's a, I mean, there's a few things coming out, but I can't say for certain because, you know, I think the time that we're in, we really have to learn how to be in flux and really learn how to shift creatively. And that's something that I've learned the last year or so. It's like, you know, sometimes things don't get finished until the last minute or you go one direction and it's like, nope, that's not going to happen. And then you go another direction. It's like, looks like it's going to happen. And then something happens at the last, you know, moment to make you shift gears again. So that's probably been my biggest lesson right now of, of all this work. So. Yeah. I got a question. I'll, I'll put a question out there. Um, just from like Missy and Gary, like all of, like the different things that you've done and that you are continuing to do and grow. What are just like if like we have some youth on here watching or some of my students on here watching, what are something that you um, some advice that you give them in terms of like the this world that we are uh, working and living in? Um, <clears throat> for younger people, um, I feel like your your grandma. Um, Sharon really instilled a lot of um, a lot of good lessons for me and like how we approach young people as well as you know my dad too <clears throat> and then it's a constant you know looking back behind I shouldn't say looking back behind us but just paying attention to some of the signs of what's happening right now and right now we are you know we're in the seventh generation right now and this is a time when our youth are coming into leadership so for me when I communicate with young people when I you know, work with young people, I'm always um, backing up the fact that they're here for a reason, you know, times are really hard. And some of the challenges that not only adults are going through, but young people, especially, um, are, are some that maybe like, I look at my son, I look at Lewis, and you know, what he's been through the last two years, too, um, is just preparing him for what comes next. So it's really strengthening us and getting us prepared for taking on that leadership, or I should say the younger generation taking on that leadership. I feel like my generation is just really kind of like that connector. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm just connecting our elders to our youth and I'm, I'm somewhere in between creating that space too, you know? So always create space for others as you move forward, so. Yeah, thank you. Um. Well, you got to have a stick to in this, uh, in, especially in the arts of filmmaking, uh, all of the arts. You, you have to you have to kind of make a commitment at some point to yourself <laughs> or to somebody that's helping to manage you or help you. Uh, you got to make a commitment to the to the to, to kind of sticking with it, you know, and uh, finding ways to get better at things. Uh, you know, um, always honing your skills. Uh, you have to take care of yourself in terms of your health. I mean, for years I didn't uh, until it all caught up to me. And then I had to start making, uh, you know, cutting out the soda pop and all that stuff, right? Because, you know, nutrition and diet are feeds the brain, right? So you feeds your creativity. So 
you got to live healthy and or stay in shape. You know, you got to have a physical discipline. Yeah, you know, you got to exercise. And uh, me, I've always used kind of weight training as a method of de- developing some discipline. Some people use um, yoga, which is extremely good because it keeps you flexible. I mean, uh, if you're young, you know, become a dancer for a while, you know, and all that physicality that comes with that, you know, in terms of modern dance or ballet or all the other disciplines of dance. But, um, you know, um, uh, you know, practice, uh, you know, if you're a young actor, just read aloud, grab a magazine, read it out loud to yourself in a room. So nobody have to bother nobody. But if you can tell an elder a story from a book, read a book to them because that, you know, reading and literature helps uh, whether it's in your own language or in other languages that you work in, or whether it be in English or other languages, Spanish and French, then, you know, the more uh, diverse you are that way, the more success you'll have. And the stick to itness, for instance, uh, me, I'm 60, I'll be 68 in June, and I've never been so busy. So the more you stick with it and work at it, uh, the bigger the payoff. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I've never been this busy where I'm doing uh, Resident Alien. You can see it every Wednesday night at uh, 9 o'clock your time on Sci-Fi Channel. Um, uh, I already did Rutherford Falls, which is another native-driven series on uh, Peacock Network. Uh, there's a Navajo girl kind of a show running. We've never had a, a native showrunner for television series before. Rutherford Falls with uh, Ed, El- Ed Helms, big time comedy actor um, from The Office. Uh, I'm just going off to Oklahoma to shoot Reservation Dogs, which has Taika uh, YTT as executive producer, Sterling Harjo as uh, director, writer, and a whole native cast, you know, all down on the res there in Oklahoma. And uh, I'm going to uh, Spain to work on this thing called The English with BBC and Amazon with a big time British actress. I can't think of her name right now, but I mean, geez, you know, I, I, I never been so busy. And I just think because I've managed to hang in so long, I'm at an age where, you know, people need me right now. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm filling a void for me. It's, it's wonderful. I mean, I wish it was when I was 30, uh, <laughs> although I was pretty busy then too, you know, but, I'm more busy than I've ever been. I mean, to be a part of four series, and then we just got renewed by by Resident Alien, and there's a whole Native storyline in there. So uh, it's never been so prosperous for us as far as storytelling goes. So you're in the right field at the right time, as it were. Yeah, I I appreciate that those words, and um, a lot of those just resonated with me and you know just like in terms of you know I grew up playing football and um I try to tell my kids like I, I always re- relate to my youth is like um this is you know this is this is a sport you have to take care of yourself because a lot of them are strong vocally you know what I mean with the physicality is what they lack and um trying to get that into them and we you know we do like things where we give out healthy meals at our group and we only do water and so I appreciate those things that you're telling them and um that they get to hear because uh, it's truly important and you know they're always just hearing it from me but um from a professional you know and someone that's been in the game so long it's nice for them to hear that because the physical part is uh will get you through well i mean performance is all about the physical part Mm -hmm. too you know besides and the other part of acting really is listening right Mm -hmm. 50 percent of acting is listening so that's almost the hardest thing to do, you know, is listen to people. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you can tell when people aren't listening to each other and um, on stage, especially, right? So it's important. That's half of acting is listening. So. Oh, thanks. We had a question about if anyone has done any work with VR or augmented reality. Um, Yep, we're actually working on um, more of something that's called expanded cinema. And it's taking film, it's taking performance, it's taking live score, uh, uh, VR, AR, uh, 360, and then also 
um, taking it either outside of the theater, outside of, um, you know, indoors and then bringing it outdoors or just making it more accessible to people either living on reservations or communities that won't um, have the opportunity to, to have access to museums or film festivals. And it's a collective of artists, including myself. And we actually were re really fortunate to have our first um, and only uh, expanded uh, cinema in October of 2019. So it was right before everything shut down. And um, I actually have the trailer that I screened last night if we have time to watch it. Um, but it talks about like the Coyote Way film and then how that has um, progressed to, um, to this expanded cinema experience. So for me, really looking at VR and AR, you know, there's not, I think people see it as like a consumer technology, but it can also, you know, you can also use it to tell a narrative story um, as well. And so that's really what we're looking at doing is bringing in more story into um, VR and also bringing in um, just more, you know, I think more to, I guess I want to say like to indigenize it because we have a lot of different layers to our stories and we have a different, a lot of different elements to our culture. And so to say like this one film is about our people and that's it, right? There's so many more, more people that are like, well, I live in the city or well, I live on the reservation or well, I live in the suburbs or, you know what I mean? There's like so many different perspectives that we can take into it. Uh, no, I don't know the, uh, uh, these new mediums much uh, and I've never been, uh, uh, hired to work into them. I'm still reading books aloud for people. <laughs> so I'm uh, I'm uh, the next. I'm the older generation, so it's a new generation medium. So one of my sons got a uh, um, virtual reality Oculus game, uh, I think augment. I don't know virtual virtual reality Oculus game for uh, over the holidays, and it blew my mind and that's where my mind went like wow how can we tell stories with this because it um and that's where it's going and the kids are you know excited about it and even sometimes like my he'll he'll play with it for a while and then he'll be done and then he'll say mom it, it got too scary it was too real <laughs> so i'm like wow let's tell stories yeah uh, we do have a, a, you know, you can um, submit those uh, pieces as well to the Santa Fe Independent Film Festival. We have a section for, for those new technologies, and um, you're welcome to submit your work to that as well for that. Okay, we'll definitely do that. We haven't dropped our 360 video yet. We were going to drop it in 2020, but now we're like, okay, let's just send it into the world. So that would be a really good opportunity um, you see, they're anxious to see your, or the one panelist would like to see your piece. I mean, even a portion of it. Okay. Maybe you can be better at the finishing of it than me. Okay, let's do that. My son just walked by, by the way. That's what that noise was. He has a broken leg. So he's kind of, he's in the film, he's in the film too. So I'll share and we'll go ahead and uh, listen to it. My name is Lewis Whitman. I play Charlie in the short film, The Coyote Way, Going Back Home. Going Back Home is the first short film in the Coyote Way trilogy, rooted in the traditional Native American trickster stories, which balance elements of the metaphysical and physical human existence. This sci-fi docu-narrative film pushes the boundaries by incorporating time travel, parallel universes, and DNA memory. What makes this film so special? There is no verbal dialogue in the film, and the only form of communication is Plains American Indian Sign Language. Historically, American Sign Language is based off this intertribal trade language and is utilized in pre-colonial contact. I see this film as a means to document, preserve, and revitalize indigenous language and culture for future generations. I think this film will change the way people see Native Americans from film because, you know, not all, you know, in these old Western movies where they're wearing their war bonnets, going around killing people and shooting them with bow and arrows, 
you don't know their names. They're really weird names. It's not like that, you know. We don't go around killing people and, you know, saying weird stuff and doing weird chants. We're actually, we're just like everybody else, you know. There's a lot going on there. Whee! Nice. Oh my goodness, my friends, it is 152. If we have closing parting thoughts from each of you, that would be fabulous. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Gary, I'll send you an email about the other stuff we got to do. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you so much. That's all I can say. And whatever you want to end with, uh, I'm grateful. Oh, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got 20, 29 now. That's good. Um, I, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, watching all the films. I've been, uh, the ones I've watched, I'm very impressed with. Very good work uh, coming in. Certainly it's improvement from the last time I juried. So I see progress at the school. Uh, congratulations to David and Jeremy and, Elizabeth, and of course, uh, it's nice to meet Kirby and see Missy, whom I've known since she was a child, but it's nice to see her doing such good work. So um, my love to all of you and uh, have a good, uh, a good spring. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me. And like I said, a pleasure to be on the panel with yeah. such uh, titans in the game and uh, make which for having me. Uh, pass to Missy. Thank you, Liz, David, Jeremy, um, Kirby, and Gary. Thank you so much. It, it was amazing and fun to be on this panel with you all and everyone out there, you know, keep producing. Let's create a wave and let's continue to make that wave bigger and bigger collectively. I see some folks saying thank you uh, in the chat. Um, this will live, like I said, we'll have a, a video of it. And um, I'm not sure what, what AHAC wants to do with it, but 
um, it was, I, I'm just so overcome with emotion right now. So I'm trying, trying to just uh, chill. Thank you so uh, for, for coming, for, you know, for encouraging others to make media, for telling us your stories. Um, it, it, it does, it, it builds this wave. We are in the wave in uh, it, this is it. Uh, I, I think um, we are um, going to see quite a lot uh, of exciting Indigenous uh, production, um, even more in the next, you know, six months, year, uh, years as they as they roll out. So miigwech. Um, our next panel coming up at two o'clock uh, is about uh, jobs in photography. We have uh, Nadonis Green, Rose Green, uh, and Paul Tranny, who will be here at two o'clock. We're going to take a little bit of a break, um, shake off the uh, sitting, uh, drink some water, get some tea, do what you got to do. Miigwech, bijayeg. <laughs>